It is truly a blessing uh, to be together today, to sing songs of praise to our God, and to consider, again, how love changes everything. With this theme in mind, and the tagline, Living in Unity, let us now turn to the word of the Lord for us today. Again, from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, the first letter, chapter 1, verses 10 through 18. Hear now these words, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 18. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another, so that there may be no division among you, and that you may be perfectly united in mind and in thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household, have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas or Peter. Still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized into the name of Paul? I am thankful that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say that you were baptized into my name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not remember if I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of human wisdom, lest the power of Christ be emptied of its power. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. This is the word of the Lord for us today. Again, praise be to God. As we stepped into last week, this is the love letter that Paul has written to the Corinthians. He cared for them deeply, was with them a number of years to help start their church. But then he was called elsewhere, and while in in his absence, they continued in ministry as well as they could. He shared words of love, as we heard last week. But sometimes we don't just find rosy buds in love letters, do we? We don't find words of care for one another always on the brighter topics. Indeed, Paul could not be with them, but he still had an important message for them. As we approach today, it's one of the harder sections, at least at first, where he means to convey love, but has some more difficult things to touch on. We understand that whenever we're encountering someone in a tough place with a tough conversation, that we work through these challenges, but it's best and most easily done when we are in a close relationship with them. Yes, there are tough words of love we must share at times, but I think the big part of tough words of love is the word love itself, that if it's not given out of love and not received in a loving relationship, the words might fall on deaf ears. Indeed, Paul took a risk from far away that the the Corinthians would stop reading his letter after getting to this part. But we know he wrote not just one letter as we read here, but two, and they're quite lengthy. I invite you whenever you're uh, restless with sleep sometime in the next few weeks that you pick up Paul's letter to the Corinthians. And I guarantee by the end you'll find sleep. (laughs) Quite lengthy, but he had so much to share. He wanted to make sure his intentions for them were clear. He wanted them to hear his love, not just on the rosy things, but also the other things that were important that would strengthen them in the ministry of God in their neighborhood. Paul is, in a sense, calling them toward the light, calling them towards God's love. Some of us have plants or have been given gifts of plants in our lives. Have you noticed how the plant grows toward light, whichever direction that might be, instead of away from it? It's because light is life-giving to plants, as it can also be life-giving and mood-improving for us. But in the same way as we are to grow toward light, just like plants, we are also 
to lean into God's love. Because that is what sustains us and helps us. What gives us new life and new strength. Again, Paul doesn't want to make his intentions uh, wishy-washy for the Corinthians. He wants them to know that they are to grow in love. And that means tackling some of the things that have been tripping them up. First, Paul tells them that they are to unite in thought and in purpose. He wants them to unite both in, in their minds, but also in the mission that they share. We find this again in verse 10. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another, so that there may be no division among you, and that you be, may be perfectly united in mind and in thought. I think it makes sense that when our, our body is fully aligned, that it, our body parts work together as our brain directs it, as our thoughts and, and desires direct it. Paul is saying, move together as one so that you can actually get somewhere and not just be spinning in circles and waiting. It seems like this is a preface to when Paul shares later in this letter that the greatest of things you can do together is love. Yes, there's other things that are important that Paul gets to, but the greatest of them is love. He wants this to be a guiding principle for them as they revisit what is most essential most core of their faith. From the very beginning, the church has been built on love. It was often a bunch of poor communities getting together, gathering around scripture and teaching. And I'm surprised to see as I look at some studies that the, the only mission money that was sent out ever, the only funding they ever had in the church was to provide for the poor. They met in one another's homes. That's how much they liked each other. They gathered to share uh, in regular meals, but also in the breaking of bread. They did this all out of a commitment for love, for God, for the work of Jesus, for one another, and for anyone who might walk by them on the road. What I think is helpful for us to clarify of what Paul means and what we mean when we say unity. We should not understand that unity and uniformity are the same. We think of people that are on sports teams that wear the same jersey. But I like the example of uh, uh, international football, soccer, where the team will mostly wear the same jersey, but you'll notice they'll have different numbers. And at least one person on their team, the keeper, the goalie, will have a similar uniform but of a different color. Again, showing unity in different ways than just the color of clothing they're wearing, but that they are on the same team in a different way. That is not always seen. We need to always look the same to be part of the body of Christ. We can be different. There are ways we can be flexible in love. That we can be our authentic selves. That God has created us to be. But indeed we ought to move together in unity. Indeed I think some of you understand this. But my goal from this pulpit. From teaching Sunday school. From teaching Bible study. Is to not make you more like me. This is what Paul's saying. I didn't baptize you so that you would follow me. I baptized you so you'd follow Jesus. Apollos felt the same way, he says. Others felt the same way. Even though as they taught you, even though they were your favorite teacher, you're not to follow them. They might step away from God by accident. They might falter and need your help. Indeed, all of us look to Christ to move forward. Indeed, my goal as your pastor, as your friend, is if I invite you more into the ways of God's love, even if it's not how I walk in God's love at times, that I have done my job. Indeed, the work of all believers is to show love to others, whether or not people choose to express love in the same way. I think of the symbol of the heart that we, we see on cards coming soon for Valentine's Day. On that, those cards is printed. But we know for those young people that care about us, they draw a heart with a marker or a crayon or a pencil. We also think of how you can paint a heart shape in order to show love to other people. But some of you are more crafty yet, and you can knit or crochet a heart within a blanket, within a scarf, to give as an act of love. Or perhaps, like me, you're not talented in the arts, so you can write at times to convey your love to others. And even if you're not uh, able to write with love, 
You can perhaps scrapbook, put other shapes together to show pictures of love that you have experienced. Share with someone who cares about you. But I'm, I'm not meaning to limit here. There are many, many ways we can serve, we can live, we can do things of love that might not look like the shape of a heart. But certainly as we work with others, they feel our love. With love we create, with love we write, with love we serve. With love we offer our time, our presence. And the ways each of us share love with others may not always look the same way. But we know that with the work of Christ and the love that he shared, that our love is christened if it's given in glory to God and in care for others. Indeed, the how may vary, but that same end goal is the same, using what gifts we have been given to honor others and to lift them up in love. I think of baking, how some of us at different times in our lives have been good at baking or cooking. But I think it's clear that we have good bakers that will bless, but there are not so good bakers that will burn whatever they're working on. I think it's clear that if we burn something in the oven, that probably won't bless anyone with the smell or with the taste. So we entrust people that have the gift of baking to put breads on our tables, cakes on our tables, and other things, so that their good work of love, of care, can be showcased on our table. I tend to agree with the Armenian-Russian-American author Vera Nazarian when she said, A choir is made up of many voices, including yours and mine. If one by one all go silent, then, uh, then all that will be left are the soloists, which makes for poor harmony and diminishes the song. Indeed, we're meant to sing songs of love together, and we give thanks for those who have the gift of song and can lead us, if not in voice and least in heart. We are meant to sing together with the gifts God has given us, And for people like me, maybe humming is a better suit. But in any case, we praise God with the gifts we have because that is the way we unite in thought and purpose. So first Paul says, unite in thought and purpose, in mind and in mission. Next Paul suggests to avoid quarrels. We should hear with this part, avoid unhealthy conflict. Verse 11 and 12 reveal this to us. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean to say is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow uh, Cephas, Peter. While another, I follow Christ. We know that Corinth was vulnerable after Paul left, that they felt influenced in different ways, in differing measures from their culture. We know they, come, they came from an oral culture, which was much of what the ancient world was. But especially in Corinth, they were known for good public speakers. They were known for competitive athletics, something not too distant from us today. They were also known uh, for gathering around social status. Those that had similar means had similar times of fellowship. And those that were different often brought in exclusions of sorts. But again, they leaned into some of this that was valuable. We know that it is important to be clear about the things we say, to share clear words of love. But it seems they got distracted by the personalities, by the teams of that day, and got distracted from the team that God called them to through Christ. I think of those of us who have seen different pastors, different teachers throughout the year, And I haven't heard any rumbles of, oh, I loved when this pastor did this and this and this. We have to see that again. At least if you're thinking that, you haven't uh, thrown that at me yet. I appreciate that. But indeed, we don't gather around pastors. We gather around those who have shared love to us, pastor or layperson or each other. We lean into the ways of Christ in all things that we might not quarrel about this good teaching we heard a time ago that was valuable for us. But we don't quarrel about how it touched someone else in a different way. I am grateful in the practices of our church here that you can be a member through baptism by immersion, which we believe scripture points to. But you can also be a member by letter of transfer. And also in other circumstances, you can be a member, an active participant in this fellowship if you simply confess faith. 
Yes, we understand that it doesn't matter if you were baptized here or baptized elsewhere. If you profess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you are part of our family. And if you have not yet done that, we still are glad that you're here to participate as fully as you feel welcome. But nonetheless, we have kind of a, a more flexible fellowship. It doesn't matter where your moment of change happened in your life. If you are here to be changed by God and shaped by God's love, you are welcome to be a part of this fellowship. I wish that all things were this way, that there was a little bit more flexibility about the paths of walk people have come from, when they, especially when they cannot control them. When we consider the ways of our world, the parties of our world, the teams of this world. We think perhaps of political parties who definitely have a jargon, certain terms they use that bolster themselves but cause division for people who disagree. Those that, do, uh, those that give me concern are those that speak disparagingly about someone they disagree with. I think it's clear, but I want to make it even more clear that we're not to use that kind of dismissive language in our ministry here. We believe that God loves all people and that they deserve to feel God's love among us, regardless of what they might believe. And so therefore, we welcome people with love in ways that are not always happening in our world. As I look out in some of the places I've stepped into, it, I think fellowship is a pretty easy thing to do together. Uh, worshiping together is usually pretty uh, good without lots of quarreling in these recent times. But as I consider the church as a whole, I wonder at times how many times we're tripping over interpretation of Scripture. We look to one passage at one place and we oh, consider how Jesus might have been a commentary for them. The quarrels I'm seeing here and there, big and small, are that we're quarreling about making secondary or tertiary things primary. When we know above all else that we are to put God's love, Christ's love first. When we have Christ's love first, everything else seems to fall into a proper order. When things are done out of love, we can reorganize our thoughts, our beliefs, our practices, knowing that God will be honored and others will be cared for. When we put Christ and his teachings and his ways first, everything else for me just seems to line up. Now to be clear, love does not mean an absence of conflict, but a willingness to walk through it together. I'll say that again for myself and I think for you. Love does not mean an absence of conflict, but a willingness to walk through it together. Again, from our world, we see practices just like the Corinthians did, where you can divide any which way you want, if you choose. But with a mind of division, other people become objects or things to conquer with the goal of winning. But with a mindset of unity, division is a hill to climb while we work together to find what that path is. Indeed, people are not to be conquered, to be silenced. They are meant to be heard, that we all might grow and move forward, perhaps with mostly the same direction, but at least knowing that all that are on the pathway with us have felt heard and have felt comforted where they are. In a world that focuses on progress and achievement, we focus on people and on relationships. While there are people certainly out there who are burning bridges, we seek to build them instead. This is not an easy work, but this is the work of Christ that he has called us to be about. And so we move forward in this way. If I can explain this one other way, I think of each person in our lives having experienced something different than we have. And each of them see the world a little bit differently. As you look at this pen with me today, I'm guessing as I turn this, most of you mostly see the point of it. You can only see one part of the whole. Well, let me turn it this way. Do you see a whole lot more now? Do you see a whole lot more color and detail to it? Indeed, I think that's how it is in our own lives sometimes. We only see one point of the whole, but others are seeing other parts of it. Perhaps not the same part that we are, but more. This would explain how sometimes if I was at a further distance, that some of you would recognize this a whole lot faster than this. And I think that's how we look at anything, that some people have a different perspective because of the pain they've been through, because of the new experiences they have had that have shaped them. 
And so we give them grace as it takes them longer to sort through things. But indeed, we don't dismiss them in their wrestling, knowing that God wants us all to have a fuller perspective, not only because we have seen with our own eyes, but because together we share what we have experienced, that all of us in love can see the fuller picture together. I give thanks to those who invite us to stretch our minds and our hearts so that God's full love in the world can be seen. Indeed, in our own lives, I invite us to avoid the urge to correct other people because, again, they might have a different perspective than we do. We avoid correction because it allows them to be heard and for us, perhaps, to catch a detail we have missed before. And indeed, together, as we look at all perspectives, we are able to see a fuller whole, a whole that God calls us forward into with love. So first, we're called to be of one purpose and one mind. Next, we're called to avoid quarreling or unhelpful, unhealthy conflict. Lastly, Paul invites us to look to the cross. And I think that that, that's great because we try to do that a lot. We put them up in our churches and in our lives so that we remember the work of Jesus. But let's reflect on this with Paul once more. We look to the cross and we look to, in this case, verse 17 and 18 to reveal Part of this cross shape to us. For Christ did not send me, Paul says, to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. We know that Paul was a very learned man. He He had the best education that people in Judea could receive in his time. He was a part of the devout group of Pharisees that knew the Torah backwards and forwards and knew what they thought God meant. But then when Paul had his eyes opened on the road to Damascus, Paul felt a little bit more, saw a little bit better. Not physically, as we know his eyesight was diminished after that. But Paul indeed saw the love of God more clearly with what he experienced. We know that Paul could have used eloquent words because he had them in his mind. But he he sought to make them as simple as possible, that the message of Christ would not be lost on anyone. Indeed, he, he mentions how, in this place and others, how people would think this is foolishness, the ways of Jesus. But nonetheless, it's the way that Paul seeked to live and how Jesus lived, not just on the cross for us, but as he walked, selfishly loving all people. In a culture where they lived, where Corinth valued honor and wealth and power, Christ, embodied among them through the work of the church, carried shame and poverty and weakness. Again, in Corinth, they valued eloquent speech, but Paul takes a step back and uses simple words that those that are looking for show and for uh, fashion are not going to be easily attracted because they're focusing on things that are lesser important. Paul means to say that the word is most important, and we believe that Jesus is the word of God in the flesh. I think, again, how Jesus used simple words in some of his preaching, often used illustrative stories. But if you consider the point of when he was on trial, Jesus used no words at all. He was silent because he wanted God's work to speak through him rather than Jesus trying to defend himself against empty accusers. We look to the cross now and see it as a sign of salvation, but we remember that it was a sign of shame and disgrace in that time. We wouldn't have a sports team go out in the field and just throw their hands in the air and be done and surrender. That's foolish. They're called to to do their best at their game and to do and compete well on that day. But indeed, the work of the Christ follower is to accept defeat and know that the enemy, uh, the path of love for the enemy is the one we walk in. Yes, Jesus surrendered himself on the cross, even to those who hated him most, that the love of God might be seen. The work of Paul is written to the Corinthians. He was trying to sort some things out for them. And if I can share the same candor, I want to share struggles I've seen in our world. Not so much here, but ones that I think we should be aware of. Ones that we should be careful of and not passively go along with. 
In our world now, again, politics drives some things in destructive ways at times. In recent times, we've heard the, the term Christian nationalism. People who pair their faith with politics and say, God charges me to cause violence because of my beliefs. I want to tell you that Jesus never did that. With the same posture as the Reverend William Barber, he shares that uh, Christian nationalism, but really any belief that seeks to conquer a neighbor, any way that faith tries to justify violence, it's a belief sometimes that causes oppression and uplifts lies instead of when we and our beliefs are meant to show liberation and truth. Reverend Barber invites us to be careful with the things that lift oppression and lies, but silence ways of liberation and truth. He shares that it's malpractice when we lift the ugly things of our world and say God honors them. At least it's mal at malpractice. At worst, it's heresy, where we've completely diverted from the ways of God, where God's love might not always be seen in the things that we're doing. Now, again, I don't share these words to accuse you. I don't believe any of you have taken up violence against your neighbors or others. But be aware there are people near you who might have, who even if they haven't taken up a violence against others in our communities, in our world, they might carry that belief in their heart. And we need to be careful and sensitive to that and not simply let people choose what they think is best to operate in our world. Indeed, love guides us and we seek to carry on that love wherever we go with whatever belief we see expressed or uh, whether it's loudly or quietly. We look to the cross on which Jesus died because, again, he died for his enemies, those who opposed him. We know that he had all heavenly power with him, but rather than pull himself down from the cross or ascend to God quickly, right away, he chose to stay there, to suffer for you and for me, to show that there is a pathway back for even those who are murderers like Paul, who well can be redeemed by God's love and see the light of day. We look at the life of Jesus and know that it is the key to life for us. That is the ways of selfish love that truly help us to grow in love and help us to care for more and more people. It's foolish to the world to surrender when we're having opponents. It's foolish when we have enemies oppose us and we refuse to fight back. But I would say that if we feel uncomfortable as if we really should say something after being attacked... That it's the ways of God and the ways of Jesus holding us back and say, saying, let God handle that. We know that God fights every battle for us and we don't need to always fight back with our own words, our own actions. That God intends to invite all justice for us and that God suffers with us even through moments of opposition. In a world that can have darkness in it, we can let that in too easily. But again, with the footnote of Paul from Romans 12, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Yes, we know that God is good in all ways, and God is full of all love. And so we follow that good and that love, rather than being shaped or pushed aside by things that are more destructive and sinister. Again, we have examples in our world of how uh, negative things can shape us and, sh and misshape us, really, from how God designed us to be. But if we lean into God's love, we will find health and healing on the road of suffering, but also when God wraps up everything and makes clear that love is the thing that endures. I'm grateful for the words of Paul who speaks to our lives today, even though he wrote some 2,000 years ago. He invites us to unite around thought and purpose. He invites us to avoid quarreling. He invites us also to look to the cross that we do have around, but sometimes having a clear focus of the whole, not just a part, is important. If we do these things, we will live in unity and thrive together, like the plants that street, uh, stretch toward the sunlight. And as we live in unity and thrive, we know that we will be showing the world that God indeed changes everything with love. Let us pray. God, we can't thank you enough for your love that gives us a clear example through the ways of Jesus of how to live. 
God, we know the path forward is not always easy, but we thank you for your strength for today and the promise of strength for tomorrow. God, in ways big and small, use us for the good of those we know, for the good of those we might meet, and even for those who are struggling deeply. May our love that you have given to us stretch far and wide, that all people may know that your love changes everything. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.